Let's, uh, let's open up with Acts 17, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Acts 17, real familiar verse, verses, Acts 17. And we're continuing with the same thought we were on uh, last week, um, how to study your Bible, just some simple thoughts. You know, some people think you have to, you know, the only people that really know their Bible is people who go to Bible school or... Um, or people that, uh, you know, know Greek and Hebrew and all that, but that is just not the case. The Bible says the prophecy of the Scripture is of no private interpretation. And what that means is, you know, um, anybody can get a handle on what the Bible says and can be very, very, um, very familiar with it and can find answers for themselves. So uh, let's pray and then we'll start. Lord, in Jesus' name. Please help us, Lord. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Acts 17, and, um, verse 10. It says, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night into Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. So they're in Berea, okay? And it says, These, that's the Bereans, were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they receive the word with all readiness of mind and search the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. So what they were doing was, Paul was preaching and, and uh, you know, when the service was over and through the next day or whatever, they were actually searching the scriptures, just making sure that Paul was telling them the truth. And the Holy Ghost said, those were a noble bunch. They were a good bunch. Um, so I gave you a few things uh, last um, Wednesday night, the first one was read, read, read. And, um, and the second one was notice places that are similar as you read and mark them. You know, you're reading along and, you know, you see one verse and, you know, you're, you keep reading. And then a few days later, you, you come across another place and it reminds you of the other verse. And then you just, and, you know, you make a little note in the margin, uh, you know, the reference of one verse and then the reference of the other and, and you connect them that way. Um, and then we talked about the law of first mention. Um, if you can find the first place, something, the first time something shows up in Scripture, that often will give you um, a real key to how the Scripture portrays that throughout the rest of the book. Um, we mentioned Genesis chapter 9. And that's the first place where wine shows up. The first minute where, the first place where fermented liquor shows up. And um, man, it's a disaster. And, um, and you see that thought generally throughout the scripture. And um, so it's significant that the first time it shows up, um, the Holy Ghost portrays it very negatively. Um, so those were the first three. So... Um, so we're going to give you the next one. And the next one is, um, is pay attention to the verses and the chapters that are around the verses that you're looking at. In other words, you're, you're reading down through, let's say you're in John chapter 5 and you hit verse 18. And, and you, you know, I don't even know what John 5, 18 says, so I'm just making that reference up. But you come down to there and all of a sudden you hit something and you're, you're just a little tiny bit confused. Like, I wonder what this means. Um, one thing you should do is look at the verses before it and look at the verses after it. And there's another word for that. That's called the context. And a lot of times a difficult verse becomes clearer when you look at the context. Um, let me give you an example. This is sort of humorous, but look at Matthew 24. Now, some of you that have been with us for the year, through the years, you've heard me mention this before. I'm going to read the verse, and then we'll... We'll mention a, an incident that occurred. Matthew 24, and look at verse 17. Matthew 24, verse 17. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Now, somebody knows where I'm going already. Um, years ago, I had a friend, 
and uh, he was listening to a Christian radio broadcast, and the the guy preaching it was from a sort of extreme camp of the Pentecostals, and there there's a, a group of them that they uh, I mean it's a real doctrine for them their ladies have to wear their ha their hair on top of their head in a bun, and I mean that's a big deal to them, and uh, so this friend of mine was listening to the radio, and he heard the preacher read this verse. Let him which is on the housetop not come down. And this is what he preached on. Ready? Top not come down. <laughs> and that was his proof text for why all these ladies should wear a bun on their head. <laughs> now, what's comical about that, of course, is, you know, that, that phrase in that verse has absolutely nothing to do with hair, period. <laughs> absolutely nothing. What is the context of Matthew chapter 24? And, and a lot of you know, when you start looking at the context, what is Matthew 24 all about? And it really is quite simple. So let's look at it. Look at Matthew 24. Let's read the first three verses. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. The disciples are admiring the Jewish temple that they have at that point in time. It's, it was a beautiful structure. Beautiful. In fact, uh, you know, the Pharisees commented on one point, on one point that it, uh, at one point, that it was 46 years in building. And they're admiring this building. And Jesus looks at them and he says... You know, the day is coming when there will literally not be one stone. There won't even be two stones of this building even connected anymore. And that came to pass in 70 A.D. when Titus came into Jerusalem and he leveled Jerusalem and he literally leveled it and he leveled the temple. So, you know, the Lord Jesus is predicting this, um, you know, 40 years before that. And so verse 3, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And man, you go through this chapter, and it's just loaded with that whole thought. Verse 21, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Verse 29, and immediately after the tribulation of those things shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. So you read through this and it becomes very evident that the whole context of this chapter is the end of time and judgment that is coming. And wedged right in the middle of that is verse 17. So whatever verse 17 is talking about, it's directly related to everything before it and after it. You, you can't lift that verse out of its context and preach about a woman's hair. I mean, that is absurdity. But our world is filled with people that make absurd connections. And here you are, and you're, you're, you're reading your Bible, and you hear something, and somebody comes, and, and you go, oh, my, I wonder if that's true. And, 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 you know, it really sounds bad at first if they give you two or three or four verses, and you're going, oh, my. But if you, if you read those verses and where they pulled them from, they might be pulling it completely out of context. I'll give you another example. Um, go to Romans chapter 9, and we'll just do this real quick. Romans chapter 9. You know, when we started this last week, we, we talked about, um, we took um, a verse out of Hebrews, and it talked about Jesus Christ tasting death for every man. And, you know, we just mentioned in passing the, the, the Calvinists, and... Um, and, you know, some of them are good people and some of them love the Lord. I'm not saying they're lost. I'm not saying, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to be hypercritical. But their view of salvation is very different than ours. And part of that is because they believe that um, you really have no part in it. You know, you're, 
you know, uh, you don't decide to get saved. You don't respond to the Lord. They, one, of the, one of the pillars of their belief is they believe that the only reason you responded to the Lord is because He called you and you couldn't resist it. And now I say that, and to you maybe that sounds ridiculous, but if you, if you listen to some of their stuff and you look at some of the verses they use, it almost sounds reasonable until you realize the context of where they pull some of that from. Some of their favorite passages are found in Romans 9, 10, and 11. Romans chapter 9, Romans chapter 10, Romans chapter 11. So that begs a question. The question is, is Romans chapter 9, Romans chapter 10, Romans chapter 11, is it about God picking and choosing people against their will to go to heaven while others aren't picked so they have to go to hell? Is that even the context of Romans 9, 10, 11? So if you read it with open eyes, it's actually fairly simple to see what the context is. Okay, Romans chapter 9, verse 3. Look what Paul says. Paul says, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all. God bless forever. Amen. What he said in those verses is, Paul says, I have, look at verse 2. Now verse 1, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. Why? Because Paul himself is a Hebrew, he's a Jew, and God has called him to preach to the Gentiles, but the burden of his heart is for his countrymen. He loves the people of Israel. And so you see that in verse 3, 4, and 5. Okay, so go to verse, um, verse 27. Isaiah also crieth, that, that's the, the New Testament word for Isaiah. Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. Verse 31. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Look at chapter 10, verse 1. You're right there. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Look at verse 19. But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people. And by a foolish nation, I will anger you. But Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them. This is a reference to, you know, the Gentiles. I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel, he saith, all day long have I stretched, more, stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. Go to chapter 11, verse 1. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite. Look at verse 7. What then? Verse 7. Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for. Look at verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the time of the Gentiles be come in. So it's very obvious as you read through, you know, the, the book of Romans is an amazing book, and it was written to the, the saved people in Rome. But you hit chapters 9, 10, and 11, and most people will tell you, they call it a parenthesis. It's like all of a sudden, he breaks away and he talks about the, the working of God among the Jews versus the Gentiles. Romans 9, 10, and 11 is very much about Israel and what God has done with Israel and his purpose with Israel. So, you know, to go there and to, to wax eloquent on how God chose this person, God cho didn't choose this person, and, and um, you know, you, you have abandoned the context. So you need to remember that. Okay, so, so all I'm saying is, when you're reading 
and you, you, you hit a difficult spot. It was funny. I had a friend of mine. His, his mom got saved. His mom had been uh, very religious all her life, but she did not know the Lord. She went to a church that did not preach the gospel. And um, man, when her son got saved, I think her son got saved when he was like in his 30s. And, and her son and her other son both came to know the Lord Jesus Christ about the same time. And they were so happy to be saved, they went home to tell mom. And wow, mom was not happy because mom saw their embracing the Lord Jesus Christ as, as being um, a traitor to their upbringing. And she literally started swearing at them and kicked them out of the house, told them never to come back. Well, you know, after a while, you know, that passed. And, uh, but they, they loved their mom and they prayed for their mom for years. And finally, she's like in her 70s, you know, and she's got cancer and she's dying. And um, she was in her last few months of life. And one day her son walked in and said, how you doing, mom? You know, and she's chatting away. And, and uh, for some reason, the mom picked up the Bible and started reading it. Next thing you know, she got saved there in the hospital room. Well, you know, he was excited. She was excited. And literally, it was like all the lights came on. I mean, she really saw the Lord Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. Changed her whole world, as it does for everybody. And um, he said, I walked back in there a few weeks later to see my mom. And he said, there was my mom in the hospital bed. And she's got her Bible. And here's what she said. All the innocency of a babe in Christ. She said, you know, I was reading. And she said, I was having a tough time. But she said, I figured out if you read a few verses before it and you read a few verses after, it sort of makes sense. <laughs> That's what we're talking about. That's what we're talking about. One of the rules of understanding what the Bible says is when you hit a difficult spot, read what came before it, read what came after it, get the context. And a lot of times that'll really give you some light. It'll really help you, okay? So you still might not understand it perfectly, but it'll give you some clues, okay, as far as what it's saying. There are some things in the Bible that are very, very simple, very simple, many things. God wrote this book to where the stuff that you needed the most is very simple. Um, one guy said this. He said, it's not what you don't understand that's going to get you in trouble. He said, most people's problem with their others say, well, I don't understand the Bible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's a, one guy said, it's not what they don't understand that's the problem. It's what they do understand. And God has written this, the things that you need the most are actually, I mean, to, to get into heaven and to get going. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, those things are actually very simple. Um, all right. So let me give you another one. Okay. And this one's very simple. I'll just mention this just quickly in passing. Um, if you want to understand your Bible, ask the Lord questions. Because he is the author. And boy, the best person to talk to when you don't understand something in a book is to talk to the author. Man, ask the Lord questions. I did it not long ago. I was reading through something in my, in my Bible reading, and uh, I, I looked at that, the verse I was reading, and I said, Lord, what does that mean? And when you do that, ask the Lord the question. Okay, now let me give you this. Leave it with Him. Wait patiently and keep reading. Wait patiently and keep reading. So here's what happens. You'll read a verse, and you, you might not understand it. Well, that's Okay. Just keep reading. You say, Lord, I, I don't get that verse. What is that? Help, Lord, help me to know. Help me to understand. Keep reading. And you know, it might be it might be tomorrow. It might be three weeks from now. It might be two months from now. You'll be reading, reading, reading. And all of a sudden you'll read something else and you'll go, bingo. That's what that meant. And you know what the Lord did? He answered your question. Okay. He might not have answered it right at that moment. But ask the Lord questions. He wants to answer that. He wants, he wants you to know and understand this book more than you want to know it. So he's on your side when it comes to this. 
All right, let me give you another one. And this is a really important one. Okay. Always assume the Bible is right. Now, here's what will happen. You know, sometimes lost people, people that don't know the Lord, that don't, don't, don't like church and don't like the Bible, every once in a while somebody will say this, well, you know, that book's full of contradictions. When they say that, if they're in your house and you have your Bible handy, hand them your Bible and say, show me one. They'll get lockjaw or they'll get mad, one or the other. You know what? They just spout that off. But I will tell you this, in truth, there are some times where you will read something and then you read something somewhere else and it will seem that they, you know, maybe the account of something doesn't match. Um, so there's two ways to approach that. Um, one is you go, oh, wow, you know, the guys that wrote the Bible, there must have been they, there must have been, they must not have had all their facts, and after all, they were just humans and all that. When you do that, suddenly you are attributing errors to the Bible. And you're taking away from the fact that God inspired this book. And the Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. So, let me ask you a question. Do you think God knows more than you? Do you think He knows way more than you? Um, do you think there's a chance that God put something here and put something here and that, that maybe there's actually a very simple answer? But see, that takes faith. But what you're doing is you're giving God the benefit of the doubt. I have, I have a book or two or three, and they're called problem. One of them is called Problem Texts. And the guy goes through, and the guy that wrote the book, he comes at it from the angle that God is always right and this book is always right. And man, he takes some of those places and, um, and he shows you what the answer is and how to reconcile those things. And some of those, the answers are so simple. But a guy said this, uh, many guys have said this actually. God wrote this book in such a way that if you approach it crookedly, God will let you destroy yourself with it. You don't want to believe it? He'll give you a reason not to believe it. If you're crooked and you want to find error, God will let you think you have found an error. But if you believe this book is His book and you believe He wrote it, He'll bless your faith and He'll show you all sorts of things. Um, let me give you a verse real quick. Look at it with me. 1 Thessalonians 2. And then I'm going to give you an example. Okay, first, Man, there's, there's many, 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 many tons of examples we could give you. But we'll give you just a simple one. 1 Thessalonians 2. We read this verse not long ago. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13. And Paul writes to the Thessalonians and he praises them for the way they viewed the Bible. Look at verse 13 of chapter 2. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing. Because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh, in other words, it produces its effect, also in you that believe. You know, you can have people sitting in the church service and some people are profoundly moved by the Bible and some are not. The Bible works. It, it's the Spirit of God is in this book and it, it works in the heart of the people that say, man, God, I believe this is your book. God says, okay. He says, I'm going to work in your heart because you believe it. This is not the example I'm, I was going to give you, but I am going to give you one. Uh, before I do that, let me, I, I need, I need, um, I need four helpers Uh, um, Alex, Alex, and I saw your hand. Eric, there's you one. Here's you one. Who else? All right. Dawson.
One of the things you'll notice is as you're reading, okay, you will notice, um, you know, it'll say so-and-so reigned 30 years, and, uh, and then you'll, you'll read somewhere else where, where maybe, uh, you know, his son reigned, and, and, you're, and you start doing the math, and you're going, boy, all these, all these years don't necessarily match. But the fact is they do. And I'd have to give you a specific example, and I'm not really prepared to do that, but I can give you one if you want one. But, um, but what you've got to realize is with those kings, a lot of times the king might have reigned 40 years, but his son reigned 20 of those years with him while he lived. They call that a co-regency. And if you're not familiar with the way those kingdoms worked, you start doing the math and they'll say, see there, this guy said it was 35 years and this guy said it was 20 years. No, they're both right. Because one is recording it from one perspective, one's recording it from the other, and the numbers do match. But I'm going to give you another one here tonight that's a, a little more, maybe a little more plain. Um, okay, all you guys that got, got Bibles there, um, turn to, uh, I've got it flagged, turn to Malachi chapter 2. Everybody else, turn to Malachi chapter 2. Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament. Always assume the Bible is right. Always assume the Bible is right. Malachi 2. Okay, I'm going to read a few verses and then I'm going to zero in on, on what I want to show you in, these, in this passage, okay? Malachi 2, verse 14. Malachi 2, verse 14. Yet ye say, wherefore, because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, now he's talking, you know, he's talking about marriage, a marital context here. He had a real beef with some of these Jews because of what was going on in their, in their marriages, okay? Between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously, yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. And did not he make one? Yet had he the residue of the Spirit. And wherefore one? That he might seek a godly seed, Therefore, take heed to your spirit that none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. Now, I'm, I'm not, my purpose tonight is not necessarily to explain this whole passage, but let me just give you a couple thoughts. Okay, um, you know, the Bible says, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Okay, that's why he keeps saying, Did I not make one? Did I not make one? And, and but some of them were dealing treacherously. Okay, um, um, part of the implication is that is some of them were committing adultery. Okay, you, and he's saying, you've got this, this gal you married in, in your youth and you promised to be faithful to her and you're dealing treacherously against her. But there was more going on than just that. Okay, um, verse 16. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away. For one covereth violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit that ye deal not treacherously. Now here's what happened. Um, several months ago, I had a friend of mine who uh, is in another province. And uh, he's not a pastor, but he's sort, of like, uh, he's sort of like an adult Sunday school teacher. And he called me. And um, the church he goes to, they're not real strong on the King James Bible, um, and he knows that, and he's the Sunday school teacher, so he knew that people sitting in his class would have several different versions sitting in front of them. So he called me, and he said, uh, he said, Brother Joe, he said, I've got a question. He said, do you have an answer for me? He said, all the new versions change the wording of this phrase. And he said, I don't know what the significance is, but but his, his, his heart was right. He said, but I know the King James Version is right. But he said, but I don't know why. I said, okay. So, uh, so let me read you the phrase. Look at, look at halfway down through verse 16. It says, for one covereth violence with his garment. 
All right, so, okay, you guys have the new versions. So read nice and loud and slow. Alex, read me, read me, that, read me that, that verse. Nice and loud, verse 16. Okay, if you caught that, it says, it, it says there in the new version there, it says they cover, say it again, they say cover what? And then he, covers his garment with wrong. he covers his garment with wrong. Okay, so they're not covering violence, they're covering the garment. So they've totally inverted the order of that phrase. And my friend says, I kept seeing that in every new version. Um, who's got the, who's got the uh, New World Translation? Okay, that's the Jehovah Witness version. And it's always, it's always wild how all the new versions, they'll always, the JW version matches them. That is a massive red flag. But it's interesting how they always match. Read, read me, uh, read it to me there. Verse 16. For he has hated a divorcing, Jehovah the God of Israel has said, and the one who with violence has covered over his garment. Stop. There it is again. They said they're covering their garment. But that's not what the King James says. It says they're covering violence. They've totally inverted the phrase. Okay, um, Dawson, which version you got there, bud? New, you know what they'll tell you? They'll say, well, you know what? We know, some people will say that we know those, those other versions are corrupt, but really the New King James is better. Is it? Stop. You heard it again. They're covering their garment, not the violence. Who's got the last one? Eric. Uh, He's covering himself. Okay, that, which version do you have? The NIV. So, so um, in all the new versions, they, they totally swapped the phrase. And so my friend said to me, he said, you know, Brother Joe, do you, do you, do you know why? He said, he, said, I'm, he said, I don't even, he said, I'm not even sure I understand the significance of that change. And I said, okay. I said, give me a little bit of time. I said, give me, give me a day and let me look at it. So um, I looked it up. And even in the commentaries that I looked it up, and I've got some good ones. But even in the commentaries, they, they swap the order. And I thought, but that's wrong. So I have a friend out in the distance. And, um, and I, you know, you guys, a lot of you guys know who it is, so I'll, I'll go ahead and say his name. George, George Antonios. George Antonios, he's Lebanese. And he is, he is a real, he is a researcher to the, to the hilt. And uh, so I called George and I said, George, what, what do we do with this? He didn't, even, he didn't even bat an eye. He didn't even hesitate. He said, Brother Joe, he said, so read the King James to me. I said, I did. I, I read it. I said, for one covereth violence with his garment. He said, okay. He said, what does that mean? I said, um, I said well, obviously somebody's covering up something. He said, yes. He said, you know the reason you don't understand that? He said, because you're from the West. He said, I understand it perfectly because I grew up across the sea. He said, you know what they do over there? He said, they beat their wives. And he said, the way you cover the violence is with a garment. He said, in the West, you know, yeah, wife beating curse. But he said, you, you, don't, you don't hear much about it. You know, it's not as prominent. But he said, but over there, he said, it's, it's very prominent. It's very common. He said he was in a church and he was a, he was a little bit of a younger man. He had gotten saved and he was over here. He was in, uh, I think it was in Montreal. And he said, some gal came to church. You know how young couples are. And this, this young couple, and, and they were young enough that they were still maybe... Um, a little brazen with their joking with each other. And um, the one young couple comes in and the other young couple is friends with them. And they go up and they notice she was wearing a lot of 
extra makeup, like it was just a little obvious. And, and, and you know, you should never do this. But for some reason, the one guy felt comfortable to say, well, man, you're wearing a gob of makeup today. <laughs> you know? and, and he looked at his wife and he looked at the guy and said, oh, I bet you've been beating her. <laughs> Come to find out. That's what was happening. How right was the King James? 100%. They were covering violence with a garment. Always assume. You might not understand it. I didn't understand it. But always assume that it's right. You'll always be right. You might not understand it. But it's still right. Um, let me give you another one. And this is so simple, but I want to give you an example of it. Um, ready? Write this down. Use a dictionary. Use a dictionary. You'll notice when, when I said that. Now, and I, I know, I, I almost feel like I don't need to say this to you guys because this is such common ground for, for our crew. But um, I, I notice I did not say a Greek. A, a lexicon is the dictionary. The Greek lexicon, that's the Greek dictionary. Or the Hebrew lexicon. I didn't say a lexicon. I said a dictionary. All right, let me give you an example. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 9. 1 Samuel chapter 9. And God gives you an example of this. 1 Samuel chapter 9. And um, you say, man, this is really simple. Yep. That's why God made this. It's not near as hard as you think. 1 Samuel 9 verse 6. Uh, verse, um, verse 5. And when they were come to the land of Zuf, Saul said to his servant that was with him, Come and let us return, lest my father leave caring for the asses and take thought for us. And he said unto him, Behold now, there is in this city a man of God, and he is an honorable man. All that he saith cometh surely to pass. Now let us go thither, peradventure, that means just maybe, he can show us our way that we should go. Then said Saul to his servant, But behold, if we go, what shall we bring the man? For the bread is spent in our vessels, and there is not a present to bring to the man of God. What have we? And the servant answered Saul again and said, Behold, I have here at hand the fourth part of a shekel of silver. That will I give to the man of God to tell us our way. Now you notice verse 9, the whole, the whole verse is in parenthesis. So the Lord, in verse 9, the Lord is going to explain something to you before you read on. Verse 9. Before time in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, thus he spake, Come and let us go to the seer. For he that is now called a prophet was before time called a seer. Then said Saul to a servant, Well said, come, let us go. So they went into the city where the man of God was. And as they went up the hill to the city, they found young maidens going out to draw water and said unto them, Is the seer here? You know what the Lord just did there? The Lord did not change the word that, uh, that the, um, the servant said or Saul said, or whichever one of them said it. The Lord did not change the word. You know, they say, well, you know what? That's why we need these new versions to make it simpler. That is not God's way. God just showed you His way. He gives you the meaning, but He leaves the original word in place. Okay? Um, look at Jeremiah chapter 7 with me. Jeremiah chapter 7. So you've got in the middle of your Bible, you've got Psalms and Proverbs. You keep going to the right, you'll see Isaiah, Jeremiah. And go to Jeremiah chapter 7. Okay, so in Jeremiah chapter 7, go to verse, um, verse 32. Jeremiah 7, verse 32. 
Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that it shall no more be called Tophet, nor the valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter, for they shall bury in Tophet till there be no place. And the carcasses of this people shall be meat for the fowls of the heaven and for the beasts of the earth, and none shall fray them away. Now, you know what? The truth is um, the wording of the King James Bible is actually, it's actually been rated the simplest to understand, believe it or not. Um, the Flesh Kincaid Research Group is a group that was put together, I don't know, somewhere in the 80s or the 90s, and um, they're a secular research group, and they were, their purpose was to rate the readability of military manuals. So they, you know, um, you know, in the military, they'd write a manual, but they had to make sure that it wasn't too technical and that the guy reading the manual wouldn't make some crazy, dumb, dangerous mistake because the manual was too hard to understand. <laughs> so the Flesh Kincaid Research Group, that was what gave them birth. So at some point in history along the way, they began to write other, the readability of other books. So someone brought them Bibles. Now, we have some of the most popular ones here tonight. We've got um, the New King James. The, NI, the NIV is still probably the most prevalent new version, although the ESV has really gained momentum. Um, the New American Standard, there's, there was few of them they rated. You know why people have problems with the, um, the King James Bible? Is they trip over words that really aren't difficult. Like thee and thou. If I say, where art thou, Elijah? He would say, Pastor, I'm right here. <laughs> okay, I, we, don't, we, don't, we, don't, we, don't, we don't use the word thou. We don't use that word. And yet, everybody understands what it means. You say, Pastor. Everybody? Yeah, just about everybody. I mean, if you're from a foreign country and you come over here, okay, I get it. I understand completely. But for the average North American, even if you've never read King James English, you still know what, even joking, you know what thee and thou and ye, you, you know what that means. My mom, you, some of you guys have heard me this story several times. My mom, I grew up in West Virginia. My mom was a country hick, loved her sweet as honey, and she loved the Lord. And um, after my dad died, um, for several years, she worked at a cafe in a major um, department store that was very much like the Bay. It was a real up, upper class, which is neither here nor there. But it was, they had a cafe in, it'd be like the Hudson Bay having their own cafe. And um, so mom worked in that store. Well, there was this um, Pentecostal gal, a much younger gal that worked with my mom. And they would chit chat. They were great friends, you know. And, and uh, one day the conversation came up about the Bible and I don't know what mom said, but the Pentecostal gal said, Emma, you read that King James Bible? All those these and thous? And my mom is a hick. She's a glorified hick now. <laughs> She's in heaven. She's in heaven. But my mom, my mom looked at her and said, you, you want profound? It doesn't get much more profound than this. My mom looked at her and said, you don't know what thee and thou means? <laughs> they rated the NIV, the New American Standard. Um, I believe it was the New King James and the King James. Here's what they found. A secular research group said the NIV was rated at an eighth grade reading level. The King James Bible was the simplest of them all. It had more one-syllable words than any other version, and it was rated at a fifth-grade reading level. But all that said, there are some words sometimes that you will read, and you'll go, boy, I don't know what that means. So, I'm like all the rest of you. You know, I grew up on English, and man, I, I would pride myself on my knowledge of English and all that stuff, but, but boy, there's words, you know. I don't understand. And I found one in verse 33. And the carcasses of this people shall be meat for the fowls of the heaven and for the beasts of the earth, and none shall fray them away. I sort of thought maybe I had an idea what it meant, but I was still guessing. 
So I looked it up in the dictionary. When I say the dictionary, I'm not talking about a 2024 dictionary. I looked at it. I've got an old dictionary, an old, uh, old Noah Webster's dictionary. And when I looked it up, now listen to the definition. Ready? Fray is connected to the word frighten or terrify. The word afraid is originally the past participle of the word affray, meaning to frighten. You know where we use the word afraid. And so the word fray means scare them away. Okay, look at it. And this carcasses of the meat of the carcasses of this people shall be meat for the fowls of the heaven and for the beasts of the earth, and none shall fray them away. No, nobody will scare those birds away. Nobody will scare them away. Well, how did I how did I how did I do that? Did I have to reach up and grab my Greek book? No. And you know what? If 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 that's how you had to understand your Bible, most of most people sitting in our churches, I'm probably I, I'm thinking. I might have two or three people in this church, and one of them is not here tonight, that has a Greek dictionary or something sitting on their shelf. The average person could never get to the bottom of some of these words. Good news is, you got a dictionary? I was telling uh, AJ about this. I came across my, uh, my um, high school literature book, and uh, this is not a, a Christian literature book. I came across my literature book in a, in a thrift store a few years ago. And I picked it up just out of, uh, you know, sentimental. You know, I thought, wow, haven't seen this thing in a long time. And I opened it up. And whoa, did I ever cross, come across something profound. The book opens up. And it talks about why reading literature is important. You know, they try to convince the young people when you're in school that it's important. And um, so I'm going to read you two lines. You ready? Ready? This didn't come from a church or a Bible college. This came from a secular publisher. The best story in the world will bring no enjoyment to a person doesn't, who doesn't know how to read it. Many excellent stories bring no enjoyment to us because we are unskilled as readers. A great story or poem says to us, can you enjoy me? If not, go away, perfect yourself, and then come back and try again. It didn't say, oh, let's dumb it down and rewrite it. Oh, no. So in this book, and I don't remember, praise the Lord, we probably didn't do this when I was in school because I probably would have remembered it would have been painful. But um, you have a part of this literature book is you have the, the tragedy of Julius Caesar written by William Shakespeare. We did go through the book. We read several things in the book, but I don't remember hitting this one. But um, so I opened it up. I opened it up. So I'm, I want to I want to read you something. And I'm going to be a little unfair because I'm not going to, I'm not going to read it slowly. But I want you to um, tell me if you find this easy to understand. So well as by reflection, I, your glass, will modestly discover to yourself that of yourself which you know not of. And be not jealous on me, gentle Brutus. Were I a common laughter or did use to stale with ordinary oaths, my love? To every new protester. <laughs> Tell me again how this is hard to understand, please. <laughs> I beg to differ. And this was in the same era. But you know what they do? They don't dumb it down and they don't rewrite it. Although in 2024, they're working on that one. You know what they do? In those, in those eight lines, there are six footnotes with definitions. You say, I don't understand it. Why would they subject an 11th grader to this? <laughs> because they want you to use the dictionary. How do I get to know the Bible? Well, I tell you what, it starts with, would you please read it? Would you please read it lots? 
And you know, you can get an old dictionary and it'll explain all sorts of things. Always assume that this book is right. Always assume that. Ask the Lord questions. And always pay attention to the context. Amen. I hope that helped you tonight. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for simple truth. God, in Jesus' name. We got a lot of people in this room. Lord, I think, they're, I think they are Bible readers, Lord. But, um, you know, Lord, no doubt along the way they've heard some things that the devil whispers to them from time to time to discourage them from reading your book. But, Lord, this book is the medium that you have chosen to just speak to us. It is indeed your words. And, Lord, it is living. And, Lord, you said if we believed it, if we believed it was your word, that you would work in our hearts. And, uh, God, thank you, Lord, we have found that true. But, God, I pray you'd encourage your people tonight. I pray there would be a new desire. And just I just pray, Lord, you'd fuel that fire and you'd help us all, Lord, that we would take great delight in thy book, Lord, in Jesus' name. I want to give you just a minute to talk to the Lord before we go. If God has spoken to you in some way from all of this, why don't you just take a, a minute and talk to the Lord? Lord, thank you for your book. God, there is no book like this one. God, it is the book that has showed us who you are, who your son is. Lord, it's told us everything we know about that other world. And God, it's alive. And God, thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. So tonight was part two. And there, there will be one more, uh, one more session, I think, to finish this one up. All right, God bless you. Have a good night. Yes.